gold coins. The story of the gold coins is an urban legend that can be heard all over the city of Cordoba in Spain. Over the years it has passed from person to person by word of mouth, and according to the legend, in the center of Cordoba, there is an old dilapidated house that is said to be haunted. The house is very big and has many rooms. All of the floors are covered in black tiles. Many years ago, it was owned by one of the most important and wealthy families in the city. The family consisted of a man, his wife, and their eight-year-old daughter. They also had a team of servants and maids who lived with them. One night, when the little girl was lying in bed unable to sleep, she heard some noises in the corridor outside of her room. Being a very curious child, she slowly opened the door of her bedroom and looked out into the long, dark corridor. At the end of the hallway, she could make out a small figure crouching down. As her eyes adjusted to the darkness, she was surprised to see a young boy the same age as herself. He was carrying a lighted candle in his hand and he was lifting one of the small stone slabs on the tilted floor. She watched as the young boy took something from his pocket and placed it beneath the tile. After he replaced the tile, the boy suddenly vanished into thin air. The little girl couldn't believe what she was seeing. She looked back down the corridor and noticed that one of the maids had been peeking out of her own bedroom door and had witnessed the same strange scene. The maid grabbed a candle and came hurrying over to the little girl. They both knew what had just happened. The young boy was a ghost. Together, they cautiously approached the place where the boy had been crouching. They lifted the tile and discovered that there was a large hole underneath it. Peering down into the hole by the dim light of the candle, they noticed something glittering. The maid held up the slab as she lowered the little girl into the hole. The child could not believe what she found. It was a pile of gold coins. Shaken with excitement, she gathered up the coins and handed them out to the maid. Then the maid grabbed her by the hand and pulled her out of the hole. They replaced the tile, and it fit back perfectly, looking like it had never been moved. The maid could hardly believe her luck, and the child could barely contain her excitement. Both of them decided that they should keep the discovery of the gold coins a secret. The maid warned the little girl not to mention anything about their find to her parents or to the other servants. The next night at the same time, the girl and the maid were peeking out their bedroom doors, eagerly waiting for the ghostly little boy to appear. They watched as the spectral figure made its way down the corridor, lifted the tile, and placed some gold coins into the hole beneath. After he disappeared, the maid lowered the girl into the hole under the slab so that she could retrieve the gold coins. Night after night, they repeated the same process. It seemed as if the treasure would never end. Each time, by the light of a candle, the girl got down into the small, narrow hole under the tile and gave the coins to the maid, who put them inside a big sack. One night, the candle was almost finished, and as the maid lowered the girl into the hole, the light started to flicker. The maid told the little girl to hurry up. She had to get out of the hole before the candle went out, because they already had enough money. She pulled the little girl out of the hole, but at last moment, one of the coins fell from the child's hands. Without thinking, the little girl jumped back into the hole again. The maid tried to catch her, but in doing so, she let go of the tile and it slammed down, covering the hole. Suddenly, the candle went out. The maid began to panic. In the darkness, she tried to make her way down the corridor to her bedroom to fetch another candle. It was pitch black, and she couldn't see a thing. 
She had to feel her way along the wall until she reached her bedroom door, searching desperately in the dark. She couldn't find any candles. With a lot of difficulty, the maid felt her way down the darkened corridor until she came to the kitchen. She rummaged through the drawers and eventually came across another candle. She lit it and quickly returned to the corridor. To her horror, the maid realized that she couldn't remember which tile the little girl was under. In the dim light, she searched and searched, prying at each tile, but the corridor was so long and so wide, and there were so many tiles that she was unable to find the right one. Finally, she gave up, and clutching her bag of gold coins, she went back to bed. In the morning, the little girl's parents woke up to find that their daughter had disappeared. They questioned the servants, but each one had said they had no idea where the little girl could be. A complete search of the entire house was organized, but it turned up nothing. The distraught parents were baffled by their daughter's mysterious disappearance. The maid decided not to say anything about what happened that night. A few days later, the mother was crying in her bedroom when she heard a voice calling out, she recognized the voice immediately. It was the voice of her daughter. The little girl was crying out for someone to help her. Please help me. Let me out of here, please. The mother searched the house again. Sometimes the scream seemed to be coming from one part of the house, but when she got there, the scream sounded like they were coming from somewhere else. Try as they might, the parents could not pinpoint the source of the screams. The father dug up floors, demolished walls, and punched holes in ceilings, all in an effort to figure out where the girl's cries for help were coming from. After almost destroying the interior of the house, the parents were forced to admit defeat. For months, they lived in the building, listening to the incessant cries of their beloved daughter, unable to do anything to find her. All of this took its toll on their mental and physical health. Eventually, the mother lost her mind and committed suicide. The father, devastated by grief, moved away and died of a heart attack a few years later. The people of Cordoba say that this is a true story, and that the house is still standing to this day. According to the legend, if you go there at night, they say you can still hear the screams of a little girl pleading for help. The house has become famous all over Spain, and sometimes teenagers visit the place at night to test their courage and see if they can find any gold coins. Others go there to explore the huge building in an attempt to discover where the remains of the little girl are located. As yet, nobody has been brave enough to spend the night there. The house is now boarded up and the neighbors often call the police because of the strange cries and screams that come from within. They say that when the police arrive to investigate, the only thing that they find is an old candle sitting on an old stone tile in the middle of the floor. The Seven Barns There was a wealthy farmer who owned a lot of land in Ohio. He built a new barn on his property every time his wife had a baby. He named the barns after each one of his children, and by the time this story takes place, they had six kids and were expecting number seven. However, the farmer's wife died in childbirth, and so did her unborn baby. The farmer went insane with grief and couldn't tend to his farm. The family had no money, and the farm started going under. They say that, one night, in the depths of his madness and despair, the farmer took an axe and led his children out to the barns where he murdered them, one by one. He buried each of their bodies on the six barns that had been named after them. Then the farmer went to the seventh barn, where he hung himself. As the story goes, 
all of the barns were eventually torn down and the land was sold off, all except for the seventh barn. Nobody wanted to buy the land because of what had happened there, so it was abandoned and soon fell into despair. They say if you go to that barn at night, you can see the ghost of the farmer hanging from the rafters, his body swinging back and forth in the wind, dwelling on his terrible crime for all eternity. No one was ever really sure where the seventh barn was located. Although it was definitely in Ohio, some said it was the Crans Farm in Cuyahoga Valley, and others said it was at Top of the World in Northampton. In 1997, a local Ohio teacher claimed that, after a lot of research, he had finally managed to track down the real location of the infamous seventh barn. He said that none of the barns had ever actually been torn down, and that the land had just been divided up and sold off, and the barns had simply been incorporated into neighboring farms. According to the teacher, he was able to pinpoint the correct location because of all the barns on neighboring properties had nameplates above their doors with the names of children engraved on them. The teacher and his son set out at night to visit the barn, bringing a video camera with them in the hopes of capturing some paranormal activity. The next morning, the teacher's wife reported her husband and son missing. Police found their abandoned car by the roadside, and while searching the area, they entered a barn in a nearby field and found the dead bodies of the teacher and his son hanging from the rafters. The Yellow House There is a strange bright yellow house in Lima, Peru that is said to be cursed. The name of the house is La Casa Matosita, and according to legend, a group of people met a grisly end on the second floor of the old building. Many years ago, an old man lived in the yellow house. He had a wife and children and lived with his servants, a butler and a cook. The man occupied the second floor of the yellow house and his servants lived on the ground floor. The man was ill-tempered and treated his servants very badly, constantly mistreating and insulting them. The servants were filled with hatred for the man and vowed to someday get the revenge. They came up with a plan to publicly embarrass their employer. One day, the old man was holding a dinner party. When his guests arrived and were seated in the dining room, the servants decided to take the revenge. They had obtained illegal hallucinogenic drugs, or LSD, and put them in the food they were serving to the man and his guests. Then, the servants walked out, quietly locking the dining room door behind them. They retired to the kitchen to await the result of their plan. After about 15 minutes, they heard angry voices and the sound of plates smashing. They chuckled to themselves. This was followed by violent yells and blood-curdling screams. The servants began to get worried. After the noises had died down, the butler and the cook opened the door of the dining room and were horrified by the gruesome scene they discovered inside. The walls and ceiling were splattered with blood. On the floor lay mangled bodies and body parts, eyes, hands, internal organs, and severed heads. The faces of the guests were twisted masks of hate and terror. Each and every guest at the dinner party, including the old man, had met a brutal and terrifying end. Driven insane by the hallucinogenic drugs, the guests had murdered each other in the most appalling ways imaginable. The sight of so much savagery caused the servants to lose their minds. Horrified by the massacre they had caused and fearing they would be executed by the law, the servants took their own lives, hanging themselves from the ceiling of the dining room. Ever since then, the Yellow House in Peru had a reputation for being haunted. Most people were afraid to go near the place. 
it is said that the house began to fall to ruin until it was purchased years later by a property developer. Later, a Japanese family moved into the house. They were completely unaware of the history of the old building and its fearsome reputation. The night they moved in, the husband took a knife and murdered his entire family before taking his own life. After that, the house laid vacant for many years until a local priest was asked to perform an exorcism there. The owners wanted the house to be cleansed so that it could be sold. The priest entered the first floor with no problem. It was when he set foot on the second floor, he had a panic attack that resulted in his death. Another of the best known cases is that Humberto Vero Viches. In the 1960s, a television host made a bet live on air saying that he would be able to spend seven nights alone in the house. He managed to stay one night, and the next morning, he was found lying outside on the pavement. He had lost his mind and had to be confined to a mental asylum. He was never heard from again. It is said that from time to time, ghostly screams and yells can be heard coming from the house. Some people have seen ghostly figures lurking in the second floor windows. Today, the first floor of the yellow house is rented out to businesses. The second floor is kept unoccupied and securely locked. And according to legend, if a group of people go to stay the night on the second floor of the yellow house, they will go insane during the night and slaughter one another reenacting the terrible events that happened there years before. Libertyville If you drive about a mile north of Libertyville, down the desolate and secluded river road, you'll come to a place where the road makes a sharp right turn. If you look very closely, set back from the road, you will find a menacing-looking iron gate. According to local legend, in the 1920s, the Libertyville Gate was the entrance to an exclusive girls' finishing school. It was a quiet and polished place where young girls from Chicago's well-to-do families were able to receive a proper education. All went well until one terrible night in the 1950s, when the school principal snapped and killed four of the young girls in his care. As the legend goes, the mild-mannered principal inexplicably lost his mind one night and in a fit of madness murdered the girls. Then, for unknown reasons, he chopped off their heads, carried them down to the gate, and placed them on top of the spikes. Their bodies were never found and the principal was arrested and tried for his crime. The authorities tried to hush up the whole incident, but parents refused to send their children to the school and it had to close down. As time went on, the horrible murders were forgotten. The girls' school was demolished and by the 1950s, the property was being used as a sleepaway camp for boys. All was well until one horrible night in 1963 when a young camp counselor discovered that four young boys were missing from their tent. In the dark, the counselors searched the grounds for the missing children, but they could find no trace of them. As it grew lighter, they approached the gate and discovered the remains of the missing boys. Their severed heads had been stuck on the spikes of the iron gate. Their bodies were never found and their killer was never identified. The police suspected that one of the camp counselors had committed the crime, but there was never enough evidence to prove it. After the scandal, the camp was forced to close down and the property has lain vacant ever since. It is said that the gate is haunted by the children who died there. People passing by the gate at night claim to have heard the sounds of children crying and screaming. 
Others claimed to have seen blood running down the wrought iron supports of the gate. They say that if you go to the gate at midnight, on the anniversary of the murders, you will see the phantom heads of the girls and boys appear on the rusted spikes. Their eyes will be staring straight at you, and their mouths will be moving, stretching wide open, as if they are silently screaming. But, if you and your friends ever decide to go and visit the gate at night, just be careful. They say that the area can have a strange effect on people's minds. You just may notice one of your friends starting to act in a very bizarre manner. And the next morning, it could be your head that is found on top of the rusty spikes of the Libertyville Gate. The Bunny Man After the Civil War, Fairfax County, Virginia became more populated and eventually an insane asylum was built there. No one wanted to live near the asylum, and because of the public outrage, the institution was shut down. The administration transferred the patients, and in 1904, the process was completed. During the transfer, some of the patients escaped and hid in the surrounding woods and forest. Most of them were found, except Marcus Loster and Douglas Griffin. The local authorities found a trail they believed belonged to them, littered with half-eaten mutilated bunnies. The trail led deep into the woods to a tunnel bridge crossing a wide creek. There they found Marcus hanging from the tunnel entrance. There was a note attached to his foot that said, You'll never find me no matter how hard you try. Signed, The Bunny Man. That tunnel has been called the Bunny Man Bridge ever since. The legend says that if you walk all the way down the tunnel at around midnight, the Bunny Man will grab you and hang you from the entrance of the bridge. Strange deaths and phenomena has been connected with the Bunny Man Bridge. There was a young man from Clifton, Virginia, who came upon the bridge while traveling. Later, he killed his parents and dragged their bodies into the woods to hang them from the bridge and then killed himself. In 1943, three teenagers, two men and a young woman, were at the Bunny Man Bridge for Halloween night. The three youths were found dead, hung from the bridge with their bodies slashed open, all with notes attached to their feet saying the same thing. You'll never catch the Bunny Man. In 2001, after hearing the tale, six local students and a guide searched the area. They found mutilated bunny parts during their search and left the forest after they heard noises and saw figures moving around deep in the woods. House of Mirrors There is a house in the old part of the Spanish city of Cadiz that is known as La Casa de los Espejos, or the House of Mirrors. It is an imposing and elegant three-story house with architecture that evokes its Spanish past. This innocent facade fools no one because anybody in Cadiz who believes in ghosts and knows the mansion's history always steers well clear of the place at night. Legend has it that years ago an important admiral in the Spanish Navy lived in the house with his wife and young daughter. The admiral's job meant that he was often away from home for long periods of time as his ship traveled from port to port. His journeys took him to many different and exotic foreign countries. They say the admiral loved and cherished his beautiful daughter more than life itself. Whenever he left, his daughter would wave goodbye with tears streaming down her cheeks. She missed him more than anything else in the world. 
His daughter collected mirrors, and so as a token of his deep affection for her, each time he returned from one of his trips, he would bring her back a new mirror as a present. As the years passed, the house became filled with more and more ornate and exquisite mirrors. The girl enjoyed walking around her home and being able to gaze at her own reflection in each mirror. Her father often boasted to his friends and colleagues that his daughter was the most beautiful girl in all of Cadiz. Over the years, the Admiral's wife had grown old and lost her looks. She hated having to see herself in the mirrors and became very jealous of her beautiful daughter. Gradually, the woman sank into the depths of depression and her resentment towards her own daughter increased in its intensity. The arguments and the fights between mother and daughter became more and more frequent during the periods in which the Admiral was away at sea. The mother-daughter relationship was severely contaminated by the secret hatred that grew in the mother's spiteful heart. She became convinced that her husband loved their daughter more than he did his own wife. Blinded by jealousy, her thoughts grew dark and vengeful. On the day the Admiral left on his final trip, his wife took the opportunity to put an awful plan into action. She gave her daughter a poison drink, and the poor girl drank the poison and suffered for days bleeding from the mouth and eyes before she slipped into a coma and died. The mother was convinced that with the daughter out of the way, she and her husband could rekindle their love. The father returned a week later and was met at the front door by his wife. She calmly informed him that their daughter had contracted a horrible disease and died while he was away. Upon hearing the terrible news, the man burst into tears. He was completely devastated and spent the next few days sitting in his daughter's bedroom, head in hands, weeping bitterly. Late one night, as the father was wiping the tears from his eyes, he happened to glance into one of the mirrors that hung on the bedroom wall. What he saw made him tremble with fear. In the mirror stood the ghostly figure of his beloved child. As he watched, a shocking scene unfolded in the mirror. His daughter was sending him a message from beyond. Reflecting in the mirror, he saw his wife poisoning a drink and offering it to his daughter. He watched as his daughter laid in bed, blood pouring from her eyes and mouth, screaming out in pain. By her bedside, his wife silently gloated. The sight of his beloved child thrashing about in agony before finally succumbing to the deadly poison was more than the poor man could handle. Stunned and full of anger, having discovered the awful truth, the admiral ran downstairs and grabbed his wife by the arms. He forced her to confess to the crime and then marched her down to the local police station and turned her in. The woman was put on trial for the murder of her daughter and sentenced to spend the rest of her days alone behind the bars of a filthy prison cell. However, the father never recovered from the death of his only daughter. He simply could not bear to go on living in the house where she had been so cruelly murdered. Each mirror reminded him of his daughter's beauty, and he was unable to get over the pain of her loss. He left Cadiz and moved far away in an effort to forget his past. The house lay abandoned for decades, its walls still covered with mirrors. People who lived nearby claimed that late at night, they could hear screams echoing around the old building. They said that it sounded like a young girl crying out in pain. 
some brave souls ventured into the house to investigate the mysterious sounds. The noises seemed to be coming from the top floor. They heard the pitiful weeping and wailing of a child splitting the silence of the night. The screams were so strange that they seemed to bounce off the mirrors as if the sounds were emanating from each one. One curious and careless individual accidentally broke one of the mirrors. They say that when he picked up the fragments and looked at them, they did not reflect his face, but instead, reflected in the mirror, he was horrified to see a dead girl. Her face bore an expression of anger that sent a chill down his spine and made him run, screaming from the house. Others who visited the house claimed that they caught a glimpse out of the corner of their eye of a girl watching them from inside the mirrors. Upon seeing this, some fled the house in terror, counting themselves lucky to have escaped with their lives. As the years passed, the history of the House of Mirrors and what had happened there began to spread from Cadiz to the rest of Mexico. The legend became so famous that many teenagers came from far and wide to explore the old, dilapidated building at night. Most of them wanted to either demonstrate their courage or investigate whether it was possible to look in the mirrors and catch a fleeting glimpse of the murdered girl. A few years ago, some young people began organizing trips to the old place. They held a contest to see who would dare to stay the longest inside the haunted mansion. They say that once you spend a few minutes inside the house of mirrors, you won't dare to enter a second time. <laughs>